if 3i Atlas was headed in a trajectory to in intercept Earth, would that be a civilization ender? Definitely. And uh, what would we do? We really have the ability to deflect that? Not really. Um, I would, you know, when uh, uh, the Iranian air defense not noticed the uh, the B two bombers uh, overhead, they couldn't do much about it. Right. Uh, and here we're talking about a gap in technology by a few decades. That's it. Uh, I'm talking about a gap in technology that could be millions of years. Yeah, but we can see this thing months out, though, right? Well, we, you were asking if it were to be a technological object that approaches Earth. Is it clear that we can cope with it? Our biggest... I'm, I mean, this, even if it was just a rock. Oh, just a rock. Uh, we can potentially deflect it. If we catch it early enough, you need to give it a nudge, a small nudge, by either bump, uh, colliding a spacecraft on it. That was tested in the DART mission that NASA launched. Um, couple the of years. DART mission. DART. D A R T. Oh, Darth. Yeah, Dart. D A R T. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a mission by which a spacecraft collided with an asteroid and gave it uh, a slight uh, kick. Really? Yeah, just to demonstrate that we can kick rocks. But with something that big, we could just run run like a, a satellite into it and yeah, with, if you do it with, uh, at that speed that it's going. Yeah, the the, the faster the better, because then you can chip off some uh, part of it and then it, it get it deflected even more. So. What you don't want to do is um, do the deflection close to Earth because then you would get all the fragments raining on Earth. You turn it and turn it turn one bullet into a shotgun blast. Yeah, and that's what happened with the Patriot missiles that tried to, you know, in the early generation of anti-missile missiles, mm -hmm. uh, they just caused a lot of fragments that caused more damage. That uh, so what you want to do is catch it early enough. So that only a small nudge is sufficient to for it to miss the Earth. Okay, and I that, heard some sort. Of, I heard, I heard some astrophysicists talking about this, saying that we would detonate nukes. Well, you can do that as well, but that's um, a more uh, unusual maneuver. You know, to, uh, uh, um, uh, there are various ways. There, there is even um, an idea to paint it on one side such that it will reflect more sunlight, so that it will. Paint uh, it. Yeah, paint it with, you know, just spray paint it. Spray paint something that's moving at a bajillion miles per hour. Well, not. it depends on the speed, of course. You need to get close to it to do that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there are various, you can shine a laser on it and ablate it so that the rocket effect will nudge it. Have we ever done this to an asteroid that, no. that you're aware of? No. No. <laughs> okay. No. These are ideas. Um, and if you detected something like this, right? If you detected something like a rock heading to Earth. hypothetically something yeah. like the size of of Three I Atlas that was uh, you thought it was going to hit Earth, yeah, that happens once. But would you say this publicly, or would you just take of this? Of course, this is a, a risk from the sky. You have to deal with it because otherwise we'll be just like the dinosaurs. You know, they were very arrogant back then. The dinosaurs controlled the Earth. You know, they dominated their environment, but they just looked down and they didn't have telescopes. And we think that we are smarter. So we build telescopes that would alert us to any incoming threat. And we say we will develop, if we see a risk, let's say in the coming decades. And by the way, all big objects were already spotted. We, there is no risk from uh, a solar system object as big as the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. No risk from that. Don't worry. Uh, only an interstellar object, because in that case, you don't know where it's coming from and what direction it will take. So, oh. um, so you think the dinosaur asteroid from, was interstellar? <laughs> Yeah, well, which is maybe three atlas, but it's not headed towards Earth, so we mm -hmm. don't need to worry right, about it. Right. But uh, my point is that um, um, right now, um, NASA is aiming to identify mo almost all uh, Earth near-Earth objects that are bigger than a football field. That was a task that the U.S. Congress gave to NASA back in 2005. And that's why these uh, survey telescopes that found Oumuamua, and now um, three atlas were developed in response to the mission that NASA received from Congress. And uh, they were aiming at finding near earth objects bigger than a football field. And in the, in the process of doing that found Oumuamua, which is the size of a football field. Now comes three atlas. It's much bigger. What's going on? It's the size of Manhattan, right? Roughly. Yeah, we don't know the size uh, exactly because we didn't have a close-up photograph of it. Uh, 
What is the best photograph we have of it? It was supposed to be the high-rise image from uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, like a little bit. but it was too fuzzy. So uh -huh. now we have limited ability to observe it uh, from um, Earth. But my hope is, so far we've seen um, uh, amateur astronomers giving us uh, images, um, but they use uh, telescopes that are you know smaller than a meter, like half a meter or smaller. However, you know, uh, professional astronomers have access to telescopes that are up to 10 meters in diameter. So those should give us amazing uh, views of Three Atlas. And we haven't seen the reports yet, but I, I'm hoping, you know, when uh, Three Atlas come, came close to the, closest to the sun, that was October 29th, it was hiding behind the sun. So during the daytime, when you were looking at, in the direction of the sun, you could imagine Three Atlas being behind it. If Earth was six months earlier, in that location, along the orbit of the Earth, close to that location, we could have taken um, uh, a radar image of three, of three Atlas because uh, we have existing radar systems that shine radio waves on objects and receive the reflected mm -hmm. signal. And from that, you can map objects. And I calculated that with the size of other kilometers or more for Three Atlas, we would have gotten an image of it. And as it's uh, rotating every 16 hours, we would get a three-dimensional map of, of the object. But we wow. didn't get that because it came there when we were on the other side of the sun. Oh, wow. So we could have known everything about its shape uh, because radars, radar waves, um, radio waves penetrate through the plume of gas. And, and we dust. were able to do that. With we would have been rule, able, right? Also, if we had the same infrastructure on Mars, we could have done it, but we don't. We don't have radars on Mars. Wow. So it would have been really nice if we could do that. And uh, it's something to think about for the future in terms of, and by the way, I had a podcast interview um, just a few days ago. Um, the former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, invited me. Mm. And he said, Avi, what you have done in recent months in terms of increasing awareness to space exploration is more than was done ever before. Right. And so he congratulated me for doing that. And, you know, for me, the biggest reward that I get is, you know, obviously if it turns out to be a technological object, it's the biggest discovery ever, you know, and it will change the future of humanity and politics, financial markets, everything will respond to it. However, you know, just being able to get the public attention to science is extremely important because right now, many people feel that science is an occupation of the elite. And I don't see it that way. I see it as an opportunity to pursue our curiosity, you know, just, and, and listening to the public is an important part of that. And uh, the public resonates with my message. I have uh, more than 100,000 followers on my uh, essays on, on medium.com. These are not tweets that take you a few seconds to read. They take five minutes to read. And I get a huge volume of emails mm -hmm. from all around the world. And some of them I posted, actually, some of those. And um, some of those emails are from parents, like a, a mother that says, thank you for exciting my kid to, to become a scientist. He now wants uh, a telescope for the holidays as a gift. And a father that is a former U U.S. Air Force pilot said, that because of you, my daughter now wants to become a scientist. She keeps talking about aliens and that's what mm -hmm. excites her. Now, how often can you get kids excited in science? Right. And, what, and I cannot see a better reward than that. Uh, so that by itself to me is the best I could hope for. Um, and as I always say, it's not about me, it's about explaining that science can bring us to a better place if it's uh, done with humility to learn something new and with attention to what the public cares about. That These are two ingredients that are, mm. for some mysterious reason, not followed in academia. So instead of saying $10 billion to microbes, we should say billions of dollars to both technological signature and biological signatures. Mm. Thank <laughs> you.